Okay, thank you, and thank you for this invitation here. So indeed, I want to talk on the dynamics of floating structures. So as Nicola told me, it was an ambitious title, but uh, the ambition will stop at the, at the title. Essentially, what I will do is just to formulate uh, the problem. So the problem is, it, it was motivated by uh, a project with the, the Beckham in Bilbao, Bass Center of Applied Math, and Tectania, who, which is a company working on uh, wave energy. So the, the problem is that they want to make electricity by using the motion on, of some floating structure, and the motion is created by the uh, incoming waves. And especially they are working on the mooring system, you see these cables here that, that are uh, holding this uh, structure, and they want uh, to know uh, what will happen when they will have big waves and if they can uh, handle uh, the, and, and, and hold the, the structures. So the, of course the key word here is that we will have some nonlinear effects and this is what they wanted to understand. So the problem, I, I, call, I could also do it for, for both, any kind of uh, floating uh, structure, is uh, that I want to find uh, the motion of the wave. So this is a classical water wave problem if I didn't have uh, the structure, floating structure here. The only new thing is that I have a floating body here. So what does it mean? It means that I have a rigid uh, body and a part of which, uh, which I will call the wetted uh, region, so this is why I have a W here, is in contact with the water. And this uh, part of the bottom of the boat, I will say that it's a parameterized function, zeta W. So W is for wetted uh, uh, region. And otherwise, there is a standard notation, the same as in uh, Thomas talks. I will just put it here to remember them uh, on, the, on the slide. So here I have zeta W. Otherwise, this is, this, uh, the surface of the water is always parameterized by a function zeta of t and x. x is a horizontal dimension. And the total depth of uh, the, the fluid will be h. Okay, so if I have the rest at z is equal to 0, uh, the bottom will be at minus h0. I could handle without any problem uh, some non-flat bottoms, but I will do it for simplicity with a flat bottom. Okay, so we want to understand this double uh, free boundary problem. It's a double free boundary problem because we have one free boundary here, which is a standard water wave problem. And the second one is that you have to know uh, the dynamics of this boundary problem, which is uh, what is the, 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 the geometry of the wetted uh, region, and how it evolves. So for this talk, I will use this notation for uh, interior and exterior region. Okay, so I didn't uh, update my, uh, my phi. So uh, here, if I take the projection of the wetted region on the horizontal plane, I find some two-dimensional domain, which I will call I of t, like I like uh, interior, and the complement of this region on the uh, uh, x uh, variable, so in Rd, uh, will be called E of t, which is the exterior domain. So the restriction of any function defined on the horizontal variables, the restriction on the exterior domain will be denoted by Fe, and the restriction on the interior domain will be denoted by Fi. Okay? <coughs> And so what are the uh, equations? So the equation, of course, are the basic uh, equation that we have seen uh, for the standard water waves equation. So you have first in the free domain. So this will be Euler equation, so acceleration uh, of, the, of the free particle here, dTU plus U grad U, uh, is equal to the pressure forces, so minus 1 over rho, so rho is the constant density of the fluid, gradient of P, and you have here uh, the force due to uh, gravity. The fluid will be assumed to be incompressible, and also irrotational. And then I need some bottom and surface boundary condition. So the bottom boundary condition is a standard one, that the fluid is impermeable, so the velocity is tangential at the bottom. And at the surface, I have the standard kinematic condition at the surface, which relates the time derivative of zeta to the normal component of the velocity. So zeta is the same, zeta is all this. Huh? Even uh, on the interior region, I call it zeta. And so this kinematic uh, condition, which states that any fluid particle which is at the surface of the fluid stays at the surface of the fluid, this is valid everywhere. And the other condition is exactly like in Thomas' talk. I have a pressure at the surface. The pressure is uh, equal to the atmospheric pressure, which will be assumed to be constant. I don't have surface tension effects. This is the difference with Thomas' talk. 
So the, the pressure will be constant in the exterior region, here and here, but I will have, exactly as in uh, Thomas' talk, I will have a non-constant pressure in some region of the domain, and for me, this region will be the interior region here. Okay? So in this uh, interior region, I don't know what is the pressure. This is a difference with Thomas' talk, is that the pressure here, for me, it's not a given function, this is an unknown of the problem. So my boundary condition, my boundary condition for the pressure is just that P uh, in the exterior region, the surface pressure in the exterior region, is constant. Okay? I don't have any condition in the interior region for the pressure. So of course you have to complement this with equations in the interior region and coupling condition at the boundary between uh, the two regions. So in the interior region, uh, of course, what you will have is that you have a constraint. The constraint is that the parametrization of the surface of the fluid coincides with the bottom of the boat. So with my notation, it means that the interior uh, part of uh, zeta, so the restriction of zeta to the interior region, coincides with the parametrization of the bottom of the boat. Okay, so this is a constraint in the interior region. And now, if you want to uh, give uh, the coupling condition at the border gamma t, which is uh, the, the border between uh, the interior and the exterior region, uh, you need to introduce some, uh, some variables. So it's not, uh, maybe it's not standard variables in, in, the, in, the, in the water waves. The coupling condition will be given on the discharge. So this discharge is uh, Q, which is the vertical integral uh, of uh, the horizontal velocity. Okay, so the physical condition is that when you, the discharge uh, should be a continuous function and when you cross the, uh, this gamma t, so when you go, come from the exterior to the interior region, you assume that the discharge is constant, which means that the, uh, Q, uh, uh, the, ex the, the exterior value of the discharge is equal to the interior value of the discharge on the boundary. And then, you have also have condition for the surface elevation and the pressure elevation. So here, for this talk, I will assume that the, the borders of my uh, rigid body are not vertical. Of course, if I had vertical, so I, have, I can generalize this condition, I would just do it in a case which is not vertical, because in the case of a vertical wall, of course, you have a discontinuity in the surface elevation. In my case, I don't have a discontinuity. It's, I assume that it is continuous, like in this picture here. I have that the exterior value of zeta is equal to the interior value of zeta. You don't have this continuity here of the surface elevation. And also, the pressure, the interior pressure here, is equal at the corner to the atmospheric, to the exterior pressure, which is the atmospheric pressure. Okay, so I have three continuity conditions. David, does that take into, into account the inertia of, like, the mass of yeah, the body? Yeah, wait. At this moment, yes, everything is taken into account in this. I, the equation, all this, and then I'm, what I'm going to show, is as I said, I, I would have very few theorems, but just to formulate the effects that are acting on the, on the boat. And the so this is a problem which is not new and which was formulated uh, by Fritz John in the two papers in uh, 49 and 50. And he, he did it in a very uh, simplified way. So for him, he had this uh, uh, rigid body here. And how, what, what did he do? He, he simplified uh, the equations. He said, okay, for the... I have a, a potential flow, so this is also true here because we have incompressibility and irrotationality. And he assumed that he had some um, linear flow model. So he neglected all the nonlinearities, so the kinematic condition became this one, and uh, the Bernoulli equation at the surface became this one. So you have basically a linear wave equation, a non local wave equation for the surface elevation. So this is linear equation. And then he also neglected the variation of the weighted zone. She said, okay, the weighted zone is constant with time. So, so if he removed one of the boundary problem, uh, free boundary problems, which is determining the boundary of the, uh, this boundary and this boundary. And then what he did, and which is not completely correct, is that he used some uh, uh, continued con boundary condition at the coupling uh, here and here, which are not completely uh, uh, correct because he worked with these uh, potential variables which are not very adapted uh, to the problem. As we saw, a uh, good condition, coupling condition, is on the discharge, which is a non-local quantity if you interpret it in terms of velocity potential. And also he uh, assumed uh, uh, that he had some time harmonic motion, 
So he could replace the GT Zeta by some lambda, I lambda of, of Zeta, which transformed the problem into a spectral problem. And so you have been hundreds of papers on this uh, spectral problem. And then how do you recover the motion of the, of the, of the body? Uh, well, it's just that you use the linear Bernoulli equation in the field, which gives you the pressure in terms of the velocity potential and the surface elevation here, the hydrostatic uh, pressure. So once you have P, then you apply Newton's law in the, for, the, for the rigid body. So M times the second derivative of the position of the center of mass is given by uh, its weight here and the pressure forces exerted by the fluid. So it's integral of, on, on, on this boundary of the inter interior pressure, the pressure here that is computed like this, times the normal vector. And you also have uh, an equation for the uh, angular uh, velocity, if you, if you want. I just put it this uh, for the center of, uh, of mass, but uh, it's more general. OK, so this is a very simplified uh, uh, problem. And actually, this is the only thing that, uh, that, that there is and which is used in, uh, by engineers now in, uh, by the software, like for instance, WAMIT is used a lot. These are these linear models. And of course, you cannot uh, use this uh, software to uh, understand uh, nonlinear effect, in particular, the nonlinear effect I mentioned you about the, the mooring systems. So what people also do is uh, big CFD computation uh, with, a three, uh, with a 3D Navier-Stokes equation, three, uh, uh, three phatic because you have air, uh, solid, and water, so it's very complicated, very heavy, and you cannot use this to simulate, for instance, arrays of waves in a wave energy convectors when you have several of them. So this is uh, out of reach in terms of numerical costs. On the other hand, you have uh, recent works on uh, the motion of totally immersed uh, solid. Okay, so they are in the domain which is fixed, so the domain can be R d plus one or omega, like in this picture. And in this case, the situation is much simpler because you have your body which is here, you have, as before, uh, Newton's law in the body, so with the pressure forces, and uh, you have Euler equation, but you don't have the free surface, of course, and uh, this is coupled throughout this condition, uh, continuity of the normal component of the velocity at uh, the border of the solid, which is that uh, the normal velocity of the fluid is equal to the normal velocity of the solid here. Okay? So you have some papers studying the local well puzzles for this. And uh, more recently, when you are going, if you want to get some more, uh, some finer information on the motion, you have to use an added mass effect, which is something that goes back to, I think, uh, D'Alembert huh, on the linear case and when the, 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 this was immersed in, uh, in uh, R d plus 1, so you don't have boundaries. And essentially, it is that you can prove that at least part of the pressure force here, you can put it under this form, which is a negative number times a second derivative of uh, the position of the center of mass plus other terms. And so you see that this term, yeah, you can therefore put it on the left hand side, and instead of having m uh, g dot dot, you have m plus m a g dot dot. So this is the, like, uh, it acts like an added mass in uh, Newton laws. So this is very important also very important uh, for numerical purpose. Uh, then, of course, when you are working in the domain with the boundary, uh, this added mass effect depends strongly on the position of the object. So this is quite uh, complicated. And of course, if you want to handle this, uh, in the free surface case, you expect to have uh, uh, some uh, real difficulty because the domain is moving and is a free, a free boundary. And, uh, and moreover, you, in order to compute this added mass effect, you are uh, uh, obliged to, uh, to solve at each time a three-dimensional uh, elliptic equation in the, in the free domain. So this is, if you have in mind a uh, 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 real application, this is uh, numerically very uh, expensive. And also, in this case, you don't have a difficulty, which is, of course, the interior-exterior coupling, so the, the dynamics of this free boundary uh, problem here. And uh, also, just to say that this added mass effect is very important in many fluid uh, interaction problems, and also especially for your numerical stabilities of the, of the codes. Okay, so uh, actually what I will do here, the outline of uh, this talk, is that I want to propose another uh, approach, because this as approach, as I said, is uh, if we could generalize it to the free surface case, then we would have some very uh, heavy uh, things to do, in particular to compute the added mass effect to solve every time three-dimensional uh, elliptic equation. So I want 
to use a new set of variables and the first step will be to formulate uh, the water wave equation in a new set of variables which is zeta and v bar, v bar which is uh, the uh, horizontal ver uh, average velocity which is just uh, q divided by h So Q is uh, H uh, V bar, if you want. So, so that the, uh, you see that the boundary condition on the discharge is very adapted to this formulation because you can state it as a continuity on V bar. You don't have any non-local effect on this. Then I will include the solid and show how the coupling uh, occurs. And uh, which is the novelty here, and which is why essentially we will gain one dimension in the computation of this uh, uh, of this uh, coupling between the solid and, and, the, and the and the fluid, is that I will show that the interior pressure, this is which is essentially the main unknown of the problem, which governs the motion of the body. I will uh, sh I will formulate the problem as a compressible and compressible model, and uh, I will show that the pressure interior pressure can be seen as a Lagrange multiplier that you can compute with a two-dimensional instead of a three-dimensional uh, problem. Then I will analyze this interior pressure, show the added mass effect, which is a priori not obvious, so that because the added mass effect is essentially, it says that when the fluid mo uh, solid moves in a fluid, it of course has to accelerate itself, but it has to accelerate also <laughs> the fluid which is around him. In the case of a floating structure, it's essentially you don't know uh, which part of the fluid it has to accelerate, so it's a bit more complicated. And then I will show that this strategy to, to, to see uh, the, the interior pressure as a, as, a, as a Lagrange multiplier, you can apply it on a reduced model like a non linear shallow water equation that uh, Thomas mentioned. And you can also use it on discretized model and you can find some uh, very uh, efficient numerical uh, uh, codes. Okay, so let me formulate the equation in this set of variables, zeta and v bar. So the first one, the equation on zeta, so this is a ref reformulation of the kinematic equation. So this is very easy. You take the incompressibility condition. So V is the horizontal component of the velocity. W is the vertical one. So this is divergence free. You integrate from the bottom to the top and you find this equation, which is standard conservation of mass equation. DT zeta plus the divergence of the discharge is equal to zero. This is exact. This doesn't use irrotationality uh, assumption. This is very uh, robust and exact. Okay, so what we need, you know, the equation on V bar. Actually, I will give an equation on Q, which is H V bar. So if you want to do this, the first thing that you are going to do is that you first recover the pressure from the vertical component of the Euler equation. So the vertical component of the Euler equation, this is the equation on V, so dTV plus Q grad V, W, excuse me, plus gravity plus 1 over rho dZp is equal to zero, and you integrate this between uh, some height Z and the surface. You, you know that at the surface the pressure is zero, I mean, this is the atmospheric pressure, and so you will find P minus uh, at the surface, so atmospheric pressure minus P at uh, height Z is equal to this integral. Okay, so this gives you an expression for the, uh, for the pressure. So you see that the first term here is the so-called hydrostatic pressure. This is a pressure due to the gravity forces. And this nonlinear pressure is called the non-hydrostatic pressure. So I will just call it like this to simplify. And then you take the horizontal component of Euler equation, dTv plus u grad v plus 1 over u grad p is equal to zero. You plug this p here and you integrate from the bottom to the top. So you see that this integration will give an equation on dT h v bar. And this is what you obtain, dT h v bar plus some term, so this is the vertical integration of uh, v tensor v, plus this, uh, which is due to the hydrostatic component of the pressure, and the integral of the gradient of the non-hydrostatic component of the pressure. This, to simplify notation, I will call it h times the non-hydrostatic acceleration. Just a notation. Okay, so I have a set of equations. So set of equations, this is an exact set of equations, I have no approximation. The question is, is it a closed set of equations? <laughs> Which means that, can I express all these terms here as function of a z, a zeta, excuse me, and v bar? Okay, so you have to prove that if I give you zeta and v bar, you are able to reconstruct essentially the velocity field in the fluid domain. So this is uh, the case. So you define first this space to be the set of admissible uh, velocity fields. So you look for uh, velocity fields which are in L2 of the domain, which are divergence-free and curl-free. 
and that has uh, uh, homogeneous no, uh, normal components at the, uh, at the bottom. So the proposition is the following one. So you take zeta, which is uh, w1 infinity. So you cannot assume more on the, on the surface parametrization. You see that you have an angle here at the contact line. So the regularity you have to work with is very low. It's Lipschitz. You, have, you cannot have uh, more than this. So the first is that you take a velocity field. You take the average of its, of its horizontal component. And so this, you can prove that it works as, as a trace, essentially, because you see that u, if u is satisfied this and this, essentially u is in h1, its trace will be in h1 half of the boundary, and the average is also in h1 half, okay? So it's, it has, works as a trace. And then, of course, you need uh, the reconstruction mapping. So you start with uh, uh, an, a vector, which would be a, an average vector, and you want to reconstruct the velocity field. So you, you, the way you do it, is that you take the gradient of a velocity potential, which you find by solving a, a, this, so it has to be harmonic in the fluid domain, and uh, its value at the surface should be the inverse of the dirichlet neumann operator that Thomas mentioned applied to this quantity. So just the dirichlet neumann operator, we know that it is essentially a bijection from a, a homogeneous sobless uh, spaces of order one half, uh, into the subspace of h minus one half, which are the derivative of function in h one half. Okay, so you see that you have the, the re regularity that you need, the space needed. So this is well defined in in a, in a homogeneous uh, sobolev of order one half. Okay. And of course, this reconstruction mapping is a right inverse to uh, the average mapping. Okay, so this proves that this set of equation uh, is uh, is closed, and you can work. You can see this as an equation on zeta and and v bar. And, um, okay, so now the question is how, what happens if I put a floating body? So the only difference with the analysis I have made is that I have this red term, which is exactly as in Thomas' talk, I have the uh, pressure applied at the surface, except that the uh, pressure at the surface is given by the atmospheric pressure in the exterior region, but on the interior region, this is an unknown uh, function that you have to determine. So... Yeah, so you said it's a right inverse. So yeah. Do you know something about whether uh, left inverse left inverse is you, you have to define the range uh, correctly so uh, because you can you can you cannot all, uh, it's, uh, the range is somehow dense or something or no it's not dense you have, but you can you can def you, you can uh, define it yes it's no, it's, uh, it's you cannot do it in an easy way but you yeah. what you need actually what you need is just the right inverse property but if you, if you want so 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 then it's on its range it also have a re re uh, left inverse. But it's not subjective on h one half. Um, okay, and so of course uh, the way you are going to determine this interior pressure is by using the constraint, and the constraint is that on the interior region zeta surface parametrization should be equal to uh, the parametrization of the bottom of the boat. So therefore, if you look at this the first equation, you know that the divergence of h v bar is minus dt of zeta w. Okay, so. You see that in the interior region, this pressure is a Lagrange multiplier associated to this uh, constraint. So you write the equations, and this is, in the interior region, it is an incompressible problem. So what should be, and maybe I should uh, insist, is that, so without any, so the water wave problem, you will start with the Euler, which is uh, incompressible. But then when you write the equation in h v bar uh, variable, the structure of the equation is compressible. You see that you have typical compressible uh, Euler uh, uh, equation uh, here. Okay, so in zeta v bar variable, the, the problem is, uh, is compressible. And then in the interior region, the problem becomes incompressible again. Okay. But incompressible with a... Uh, 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 how to say, uh, constraint, uh, the divergence constraint, which is, which is this one. It's not divergence free, it's divergence given by this. And, uh, and the equation is, is this one. So it's just a two-dimensional equation. And so you can compute explicitly, actually you have find a simple equation for the interior pressure. So you just define AFS, which is the acceleration of the free surface, that would, you would obtain, which means it's dt, dt, dt square of zeta, in the case without any floating object. You see that if you didn't have any floating object, then you could compute dt square of zeta by taking the time derivative of this, which, which should be equal to the divergence of this, and this gives, uh, so this is equal to divergence of all this if you don't have any floating object. So this is this quantity. And so the reason why you have an interior pressure is because in the case of a floating structure, the second time derivative 
of uh, the, the, bot the, the boat parameterization is different from this quantity. So this creates an interior pressure that you can solve by a very simple two-dimensional equation in the interior domain. And here I use the boundary condition on the pressure. The pressure should be continuous, so I put it here. Okay? So this gives me the equation for the interior pressure. And uh, what you can prove is that you can use this to remove the constraint. Because having the constraint in the equation is you have something you have to check to handle every time. This is a bit heavy. But you can remove it if you just define the pressure like this. So if you have some solution, so a solution, what does it mean? It means zeta, it's in v bar, and it means also to know this curve here, gamma t. So if you have a solution of the equation satisfying uh, this set of equation with the surface pressure given in the exterior region by the atmospheric pressure, and the interior region by this simple elliptic problem, then for all time, of course, if it is satisfied initially, for all time, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the parameterization, the surface uh, of the water will correspond to the surface of the boat in the interior region. Okay, so you don't need to have this structure. It is automatically satisfied. So you can forget about it in the uh, analysis. And once again, this interior pressure, you find it, uh, interpreting it as a Lagrange multiplier like this, you just have a two-dimensional elliptic problem on this region uh, instead of a three-dimensional if you had generalized the approach by uh, Fritz Schoen. Uh, some kind of free boundary condition, but the yeah, I'm going to do it. Yeah. At this point, you have to determine. Actually, this is all, uh, this set of equations, okay. I'm not able to show that this for the full equation is well posed because, of course, you need to. There are several open problems in terms of regularity, for instance. You have to need some surface which is Lipschitz. You have many open problems. But then, on the reduced model, in some cases, I am able to prove a well posedness uh, theorem, which means that for this equation, well posedness means that you have a smooth curve, curve here and a uh, and regular function zeta and regular function v in the interior and in the exterior, with, of course, an angle here that propagates, and uh, this is the kind of well-posedness theorem that you have. Um, okay, so now you have to couple this with the dynamic of the, of the solid. So if you want to look at this, you look at the, the, the equation for the interior pressure, it's minus divergence h grad p, given by this. And I want to show that there is some added mass uh, effect. So added mass effect, is that the part of the force here is uh, uh, some kind of a negative number applied to the uh, second derivative of the uh, position of the center of mass. So from the continuity of the normal velocity uh, here, you say that uh, dt zeta in the interior region is the normal velocity of the, of the solid and the normal velocity of the solid. So the velocity of the solid at the border is given by uh, the velocity of the center of mass. So I need to so the center of mass g is here, so it has some velocity uh, ug, and this is the vector rg, uh, okay? And omega is the angular velocity. Okay, so this is standard solid mechanics, there's no, nothing to do. And in particular, you can decompose the pressure into, uh, into three terms. So this is the pressure equation. So one component of it will be the contribution for this term. The contribution for this term is the contribution that you would have if the solid were not moving, if it was just uh, uh, fixed. So in this case, in particular, you have the Archimedean force and everything is in P1. Okay, so just forget about it. Then you see that what I need is a second time derivative. And if I want to see the added mass effect, what I need is a first derivative of u and omega. So when I take the derivative of this, so the derivative can hit this one and this one. So this will be in P2. So this will be the candidate to create the added mass effect. And the time derivative can also read R and N here. So this creates some geometrical terms. Essentially, this is the uh, second fundamental form of the, at the bottom of the, of the boat. And then uh, I have to couple this with Newton's law. So Newton's law this is an equation for the uh, velocity of the center of mass and an equation for its angular velocity. So for the uh, center of mass, you have the, the, the weight and you have the force exerted by the fluid on the surface, which is the integral of p times the normal vector. And uh, for the angular velocity, this you have the torque, which is applied, which is given by this expression. So this is standard. OK, since you're in 3D, the inertia matrix here is time dependent, but I don't insist on this. So what I want to insist is on the creation of the uh, added mass effect. So I will just assume that omega is equal to 0, just to simplify. You can think that you have a sphere, for instance. And uh, so let us see how the added mass effect occurs. So as I said, 
P could be decomposed, and the second component was given by solving this elliptic equation, minus divergence H grad P2, was given by, th by this term. And the corresponding force is the integral of P2 times N. So how can you put this as something like negative operator applied to the, uh, to the time derivative of the uh, velocity of the center of mass? So this is a very simple computation. So you have to define elementary potential. So this is inspired by the Kirchhoff uh, potential. So the way you do it, so N has three components. So you define three uh, velocity potential, uh, uh, elementary potential in the interior region, just by solving the jth uh, elementary potential is solved the, 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 this um, elliptic equation applied to the jth component of the normal vector with zero boundary condition. Okay, so you have three of them. And then the computation is just this one. It's very, very easy. So the, uh, the force is P applied to N, but you know that N, by definition of the, of the elementary potential, is the sum for, all the, for J from 1 to 3 of minus divergence of H grad phi of, uh, of IG times the vector uh, EG. So this is the definition of the uh, elementary potential. Then this operator is self-adjunct. You put it on the, on the P. So now it's divergence of H grad P applied to, to, to phi. So phi is a vector of phi 1, phi 2, phi 3. But then you use the equation on pi 2, which tells you that this is U dot applied to N. So just replace, and then uh, so you just rewrite it to put the, the dot u on the right hand side. So you write it like this, and then you say that n. Uh, uh, you all, uh, say again that this is uh, uh, using the definition of the elementary potential. This is minus divergence of h grad phi. So you write it like this, and then you integrate by part once, and you find that f two is minus m, so which is a three by three matrix times dot u, where m is this quantity given in terms of the elementary uh, potential. And you see that this is a gram matrix, so this is a positive matrix. Okay. And so in the end, you can rewrite the equation under this form. So M plus uh, a positive matrix times dot U is equal to the rest of the forces. Okay. And in general, if you have the, uh, the also the angular velocity, you have a, a six by six, a six mass inertia matrix, which is positive. And so then, if you want to understand how it happens, you can look at dimension one. In dimension one, you can make explicit computation. So in dimension one, the interior region is just an interval, x minus, x plus. And the added mass matrix, you can just compute it. And it is the square of the oscillating part of uh, the function defined in the, uh, in, in the interior region. So how do you define an oscillating function? It's, it, you, you remove its average. And the average way to define it, and it's the way, in some sense, to determine the quantity of free that you have to accelerate is just the integral from x minus to x plus of f over h divided by the integral of 1 over h. Okay, this is kind of a friend. So it's explicit, and you can really uh, do uh, things very easily. So as you said in your question, you need uh, to understand the evolution of the interior region. So in the case of dimension 1, this is an interval. Uh, so I will do it for the case of, uh, of, uh, of the interval. So everything is, is, is in the equation. But if I want to make it more explicit, I will show you how to do it. So of course, we can do it for the two-dimensional general case, but I will just do it for this one for uh, simplicity. So everything is encoded actually in this continuity equation. So as you remember, I said that I had surface elevation or the water depth is the same, should be continuous at this point here, and this point. Which means that H exterior of T applied to X plus minus is equal to H uh, interior of T applied to X plus minus. You time differentiate this, so on the left hand side is dt h e plus x dot dx of h, and the same in the interior part. And then uh, you say that in the exterior part, you know that you solve the equation, so dt h, you replace it by minus dx of h v bar, so this was a kinematic equation. Here you don't need to do it, dt of h interior is a function which is given in terms of the Velocity of the center of mass, its angular velocity, everything. Okay, so this is a non function in some sense. And so from this, you recover the equation for x dot. So x dot is given uh, by this function. Okay, so you have a contact line equation. And maybe it's important to comment it because it's a uh, it's singular contact line, it's uh, quite singular. For instance, you could compare it to, uh, to have an idea with a vacuum boundary condition. So for vacuum boundary condition, you have been some work. Uh, for the isentropic Euler equation, especially by, uh, by Nader and Zhang and uh, Kutan and Scholar, where you want to understand the formation of vacuum for isentropic Euler equation, which is very similar to, uh, to this problem. So 
Actually, the, the vacuum, uh, the vacuum um, boundary condition is a particular case which could correspond to say that in the interior region you have h is equal to zero. Okay, so uh, the, the depth vanishes in the interior region. And then what happens in this case, so in this case, <coughs> if I want to look at the, the, the vacuum boundary condition, so x dot is given by this. So if I have vacuum boundary condition h i is equal to zero, so this vanishes, this vanishes. Okay, so you have this. And uh, for this one, you expand uh, the derivative, so it's h dx v, but h is equal to zero, so it vanishes. So you just have v dx h. Okay, and the dx h interior, exterior uh, simplifies and you find that dot x is equal to v at, uh, at the contact point. So this means that you have a kinematic condition for the dynamic of the boundary. Okay? And this means that if you want to lift, then to, 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 to solve this boundary problem, then uh, you will essentially have uh, a diffeomorphism that will have the regularity of the velocity. Now for this uh, contact line equation, you lose one derivative more. So it's much more singular, because you have to handle this derivative. Okay, so this is a generalization of this one, but which is not a dynamic, uh, kinematic boundary condition. Okay, and uh, so I said that uh, I mentioned this work about vacuum in the, in the isentropic Euler equation. So isentropic Euler equation or shallow water equation are the same. So let's now try to see if we can apply this strategy for simplified model. If you want, uh, you're interested in doing this for applications. So how can you uh, simplify the models? Uh, so these are the full equations and the shallow water equation uh, lies on several assumptions that you can prove uh, in the case without, uh, without floating uh, object, you can prove them rigorously. The first one is that this, uh, which is the Reynolds tensor, uh, because it's in some sense the integral of, uh, of the, the, if you think about the integral uh, integration as uh, as an average like, uh, that would replace a statistical average in, in, uh, in, uh, in turbulence, then you say that this is just the first term, which is the, the square of the average. Okay, so this is the basic stuff. So you, you, you make this, uh, uh, this approximation, which is a very uh, robust one. And the second one, so you replace this in the, in the equation, so it's much simpler. And the second approximation that you make is that you neglect these non-hydrostatic terms. You say that they are uh, equal to zero. So if you want to include the dispersive effect, work with Boussinesque equation or thing like that, you, you cannot think like that, you have to take them equal account, so you have a more complicated model, but in the Savonar equation, you don't have this term. So you have a very simple system. And, uh, <coughs> and so uh, the equation like this, you have the pressure term here. And of course, uh, if you use the pressure term that I gave uh, before, the equation for the interior pressure that, that I gave before, it will no longer be a Lagrange multipli uh, multiplier for this system of equation. Of course, you have to adapt the equation for the interior pressure and by doing the same approximation. So in this term, uh, free surface acceleration, you just make the same approximation. Okay, so you have now uh, a good uh, Lagrange multiplier and you can do exactly the same kind of analysis with simpler terms for this system. And for those who know, this, there is a remark here, is that you could rewrite this system as a congested flow model, which means that you could write it as a Savonar equation with a pressure term here and with a, a saturating term here, which says that, uh, it's not, uh, I'm sorry, it's not I, it should be a W, so under the boat. So when H is, uh, is inferior to, uh, to HW, so when you are uh, in the exterior region, you have no constraint. So it means that P bar is equal to zero. But then when you saturate the constraint when h is equal uh, to the to the depth under the boat then the pressure is not zero and it gives you this okay so people uh, derived many models like this essentially with g is equal to zero for pressureless Euler equation if you want so you have this equation rising in traffic flow in granular flow in hydrodynamics in pipes and uh, the idea is that you are saturated some constant so they, these are called congested flow so you can put it under this form so it's a bit different because of the g and you could do this also for the full equation uh, of course Okay, uh, and then you could extend this to uh, dispersive models uh, by adding uh, more terms in the equation, more complicated terms, so I won't, I won't do it, but you can do the same strategy. And then you can also do the same strategy at the discrete level. So I, I will not insist, but just saying that if, you, for instance, the Savonar equation in dimension one, you can put in them in conservative form. So you can use any finite volume formulation. So you have some 
discretization for the flux here, you can choose any discretization. What is important that you choose your flow model, so you have first order, second, fourth order uh, approximation for the, the flux, is what you want. But then you compute the discretization of the source term in a consistent way as a discrete Fourier multiplier to uh, your numerical scheme. So you can do this. And if you do this, as I did for the continuous case, you can remove the constraint that h is equal to hw on the, on the, on the, under the boat. It will propagate at machine precision. So you have just to solve an equation on the computational domain without handling the, the, the coupling zone. And so this is, uh, in terms of numerical efficiency, is the same as for the standard flow model without, uh, without uh, object, almost the same. So it goes very, uh, very fast. And just to show you that I'm not lying, I just made some uh, computation. So in, th in this case, uh, I, I have a vertical, uh, just vertical bottom, and, and the, the idea is that I put, uh, I allow the, my, my object to move only vertically. Just assume that you can control it like this. I have other computation if you if you want. So here you see that you just, I just plotted the free surface elevation, and you see that I'm solving it on, on this interval. I put a, a discrete pressure term, and you see that this is the surface elevation, and because of this pressure term, you see that it takes exactly the form of my object here. Okay, so this is. I'm solving uh, zeta uh, on my numerical model for all the all the all the the domain. I'm not saying I artificially that this should be equal to the boat, and I don't put it as a constraint. It's just automatic because I have chosen the discretization as a discrete Lagrange multiplier. But you haven't given inertia to the body in this case. Yeah, wait, 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 wait. This is a case of fixed body, and so this is the same. Uh, and when now I, I I draw the body, just that you can understand what happens. So the way. Comes, you see, and then there's nothing here, and part of the flow goes below and creates a wave on the right. Okay, this is what happens. So it's not like you had a wall, of course, it would be reflected, so part of it is reflected here, and part of it goes under. And you see that in uh, orange, orange is the discharge. So for a fixed body, the discharge should be constant. dt zeta plus dx of q is equal to zero. Uh, zero. So if dt zeta is equal to zero, dx of q is zero. Of course, it varies with time, and it is continuous. This is one of our boundary conditions. Okay? Then, if uh, now this is a force motion, so I put the the object in force vertical motion, and and so in this case we create the wave, and you see that in this case now uh, the discharge uh, under the under the under the boat is uh, is not constant anymore. Now it's linear, you have a, so you, but it's still continuous, and it creates the, the wave. so it's vertical motion, and of course the way. The most interesting case is to, to have this uh, floating case. So in this case, I take uh, an object like this and uh, I, I, I take its uh, uh, volumic density and, and from its volumic density and its shape, I am able to compute uh, the, the, the place where I should have the equilibrium. So it's above the, the equilibrium, I just drop it. And if you drop it, so I'm sorry. Okay, so you see, it goes down, and it will go, and it will stabilize uh, until it's equilibrium uh, point. Okay, so for this one, I have the inertia, I have the. How do you get such nice pictures? Uh, I mean, this is, <laughs> and th th this is very. I, I mean, th and this is in terms of computational. This is real-time computation. Uh, if you compare to that, uh, uh, did you say this? This is shallow water, the fully. Yeah, no, this is shallow water, of course. Yeah, I could do it for Boussinesque. Of course, for the fully nonlinear equation. Uh, uh, I will not, I mean, there is no, not even, uh, you could try in 1D with a point vortex method maybe, but. Uh, and, and so, th and, and th no, this is not this one, sorry. And the last one is the one I, we are concerned about for the application I was uh, mentioning uh, for the resistance of the mooring system, is that then you send a wave and it will be, you can start to float because of the, of the wave, okay? And so, uh, okay, so now uh, we have some very simple model that we can use, so we can put several of them and see what happens. So, and it's very easy numerically, very efficient, so we can use it for a real application. And of course, what remains to do is now is the math, and uh, <laughs> to be for, for another talk. So thank you very much. For, uh,
thought at one point there was no vorticity, but the, there is vorticity in the... No, yeah, uh, no this is irrotational. Uh, putting vorticity, I mean, it's really more complicated, but it's, n it's not uh, out of reach. You know. So is, it, is there some mechanism for generating vorticity from the... From, the uh, from this, if I generate vorticity... Uh, no, I don't think. I, I, uh, yeah, it's true because here you have singularity, you have uh, uh, boundary effects. Uh, uh, I don't think that you that you create vorticity. No, you don't. You, you don't create vorticity. Uh, you would create vorticity uh, if you had uh, wave breaking in addition. Then you dissipate energy because this is. I didn't say it, but you have some conservation law for 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 energy. And so I think it's okay for the vorticity. I didn't check, but... Uh, you, you've restricted the motion of this to be vertical. Yeah. Yeah. But in the, in the bigger picture, you also had the omega and the angular. Yes. So, uh, so for the moment... So, okay, the, 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 the basic... So, and here also, I, uh, it's kind of cheating. I, I treated the case that I did not mention in the equation, which is vertical walls. So for this, I have discontinuous zeta, discontinuous pressure. I have to... Then in this case, it's, uh, I, I can show you later the, the numerics. Uh, in this case, this point would move. So I will have this uh, here. I have, don't, don't have this family boundary problem because they, this is constant. Okay? But I presented this one because for this one, I can do some numerical analysis uh, very cleanly and prove it. For this one, numerical, it works numerically, but the numerical analysis is uh, okay. But I can see this uh, moving. And then, uh, yes, and then I, uh, you can couple with the motion uh, like this. And, uh, okay. and, and uh, yeah, and, the, uh, and also, the next step also is to create things. Here, I assume that it's a graph. Then I will need to, to allow... Uh, yeah, I mean for this one, if it, it starts moving like this, okay, so I have two regions. Maybe a sphere. Yeah, <laughs> but um, for this one... It's Do I understand, right, that basically you recover the... or you'll be able to recover the contact line afterwards, after you solve the... For this one, yeah, you, 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 you can handle the, the, the contact line, yeah. The problem in, in, in the... So you don't yeah. have to... You can get it from the, from the formulation. Yes. Yeah. I, I without having to propagate the contact line. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, if not, let's uh, thank the speaker. <coughs>